Hey, Fried Fam. A couple of weeks ago, we did an episode on the top six workplace factors that are increasing your vulnerability to burnout. And we're going to continue that series. Today, we're going to drop into the environmental factors that increase your vulnerability to burnout. Now, all of these things are backed by research in some way, shape, or form. A lot of the research on what we see in our environment and how we interact with our environment is done on the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Some of it is on the vagus nerve. Some of it is on certain brain activation areas, et cetera. But regardless, I am not saying these things today just because I think so. Is, is what you need to know. So these are things that have been backed by research that actually matter, that make a difference in your day-to-day -day life, your ability to modulate stress, your risk factors for burnout, and more. A lot of times, the reason that I'm doing the environment bucket second, there are six buckets that I work within work we already covered, now we're doing environment. The reason I'm doing environment second is because a lot of times, this is something that we have a lot of control over for relatively low cost, if not totally free. And we're not thinking about it because so much of the like, quote unquote, self-help work out there is about fixing your mindset and managing your perfectionism and doing something about your boundaries. And sometimes when you can't do any of those things, I want you to know that there's still something that you can do, still, still some changes you can make, still some influence you can have without having to be focused on doing all this sort of like work all the time. I hope that that makes sense. I just want you to have for some people, the environmental stuff is much harder to change, but for some people, this is like a super easy ad. If you find some of the suggestions that you listen to today to be really easy for you to do, then yay, let's do some easy things that help your body enter parasympathetic state, that help your vagus nerve be toned, that help your body modulate stress more appropriately that don't add to, at, at the very least, come back to neutral instead of adding to your overall stressors. So let's talk environment. Here are the top six things that get in your way in your environment. Number one, not using or not having access to green space. So if you do not have a park or a forest path or anything green around you. This might be because you live in a city. It might also be because you live in the middle of a desert. Lack of access to green space increases your vulnerability to stress and therefore to burnout. Using green space decreases your stress levels, increases your parasympathetic, so your rest and digest nervous systems function, and increases your vagal tone. So this green space can also be called blue space. The, the research is mostly on sort of trees and green areas and ocean, lake, water, et cetera. So, so blue and green. If the only thing you've got is the desert, then the sky blue works for you. Like that's that can be enough, but that means you still have to be outside and take advantage of it. So what does it mean to take advantage of green space? It means to be outside, in it, looking at it, without your phone. Looking at the horizon is part of it. Sometimes some of the research studies say that what finding that horizon line and staring into it is one of the things. Walking in nature is also useful. There's a lot of research now that says that walking 40 minutes three times a week really increases the function of your prefrontal cortex, which is one of the things that decreases with chronic stress and burnout. Now, you might not be able to walk for 40 minutes when you're burnt out. If you can only walk for five, I'd rather have you do five and have you do it outside instead of on a treadmill so that you get some of the nature in than otherwise. And if you could do 40 minutes, but you can only do it if you walk really slowly, I would rather you walk a mile in 40 minutes than try to hurry up to make it quote unquote worth it and then miss out on the nature around you and in being able to enjoy what you're doing because you're stressing your body too much by moving too fast and maybe creating some sort of inflammation and pain by pushing it too far. So basically, go outside is the free solution here. 
And if you don't have any access to green space, if you are in the middle of a city and the park is not convenient and you're not going to be able to get out into it, then bringing plants into your home is a smart choice. We did an episode recently with my friend Jamie Rabin, who is a feng shui specialist and not only, but one of the things that she does. And she mentioned that having potted plants is a stronger thing than having cut flowers. But if you absolutely love cut flowers, then do that. And if that's the easiest and fastest thing for you to do, then cool. The point here is to find some stronger connection to nature. So that's number one. Number two is a lack of exposure to the natural transitions of light that happen before and around sunrise and before and around sunset. Now, there is a ton of research that tells us that when you view the sunrise and view the sunset and you have um, your eyes are exposed, there's actually cones and rods in your eyes that are exposed to a particular level of blue light that's given out during those hours that help to set off your hormonal cascade, the circadian rhythm of your hormonal cascade properly. So if you are up and you're able to, you're not interrupted right away by your cell phone and you're able to get outside, you know, sort of within an hour-ish of sunrise and you're exposed to this blue light, then your cortisol and your melatonin and your adrenaline and your so all of these hormonal cascades that are supposed to go up and down throughout the day you're starting them off properly on their right pathways which means that the rest of your day will be easier which means that your sleep will be better which means that everything works better so the the second thing that we're really missing is a, a natural exposure to these morning and evening lights and excess exposure to like fake blue light from screens after the time where our blue light is supposed to drop off. So if I don't expect everybody to be able to do to change everything and like go, you know, walk outside for every single sunrise and sunset, that's not reasonable. But what is doable for you within this? Can you start by eliminating some phone time in the late afternoons when that blue light will be really interfering with your hormonal cascade? Can you not pick up your phone in the mornings before you're able to at least go outside for a couple of minutes, even if it's at the wrong time, but just not have the first light that your eyes see in the morning be your cell phone light? Can you start there? That might be step number one. And eventually maybe you'll work up to getting up and walking in the mornings at the time that's really beneficial for you, right? But we don't have to start there. Do the thing that's easiest first. So in the first example, if cut flowers is the easiest thing for you to start with, then start there. It's better than nothing. If not picking up your phone first thing in the morning is the way you can start with this number two, then start there. Better than nothing. So number one, vulnerability to burnout is increased when you have a lack of access to green space. Number two, when you have a lack of exposure to dusk, dawn, slash natural light. The next thing on the list is been really interesting to me because there's research that goes for and against different options. But the third thing that can increase your vulnerability to burnout is feeling a physical slash emotional slash mental lack of safety within your home. Now, this is environmental because you might feel unsafe because of where your home is located. You might feel unsafe because of the quality of locks or and or alarm system that you have or don't have. You might feel unsafe because you're too close to your neighbors. You might feel unsafe because of the people you share your home with. That's a little scarier, right? But there's a lot of reasons that you might feel unsafe in your home. So our job here is to do some sort of assessment and say, how can I increase my feelings of safety in my home? One of the silly things that comes up often in the research is how people store their knives. So if your knives are washed and then put, you know, blade side up in your dryer, you might want to dry those by hand and then put them away right away so that you're not leaving out these sort of really unsafe things. Like if if every time you 
put a dish in the dishwasher, you're worried about poking your hand on a knife that you have or a fork that you have face up, you might want to flip it around so that you feel safer. So are there small little things that can help you feel safer? Another thing within this like safety and lack of safety is clutter. So this is like parts A and B of, of number three. If you have a lot of clutter, if you don't know what you have in your home, if you feel overwhelmed every time you look at your desk or your dresser or your makeup drawer or whatever it happens to be, you are unwittingly and unknowingly increasing your vulnerability to chronic stress and burnout. Does that mean that you have to have everything like up to home edit standards all the time where everything's in a clear plastic container? No, absolutely not. I find a lot of things. I love watching the home edit because I love the way it feels at the end, but I do find all of that plastic to be pretty wasteful and unnecessary. So I'm not saying that you have to be like super Virgo organized, the best thing in the world. However, there should be some regular system where you clear out the things that are cluttering you. And when you're burnt out, this can be really hard. So you do one small thing at a time. Um, if you have ADHD, this is also pretty hard. You might have something that's called doom piles, where like things just pile up, paper, papers especially, just pile up. One of the suggestions that Jamie Rabin made when she was on the show was to get a box for your doom piles so at least they look good until you can manage to take care of them. And this seem, might seem counterintuitive, but how it looks and what it's doing to your brain really matters. So I want you to spend some time looking around the desk that you maybe work at, the place that you cook, the place that you sleep. I know that you probably heard an episode with my former client, Monica Wang. One of the very first things we did in her burnout recovery was change out her bedside table because we were talking about these feelings of safety. And she said, you know, every single night when I go to bed, I'm afraid I'm going to hit my eye on the corner of my nightstand because it's square and it's a little bit higher than my bed. I don't want you being having fear while you're getting into bed, I don't want you having fear in your house really very often at all. So what, one of the things that we did was we I had her go to Ikea and buy a bedside table that was short, a little bit shorter than her bed and was round so she didn't have to think about this. When we're thinking about burnout recovery and we're like, go boundaries and have these conversations and maybe like quit your job or talk to your manager or do all these big life things, sometimes the first thing you need to do is buy a round nightstand or something else equally seemingly insignificant in your world that will help lower your stress levels so that you can manage the other things in your life with more ease so that you have more buffer in your stress response system to be able to handle the rest of life. So we have lack of access to green space, lack of exposure to dusk, dawn slash natural light, lack of feelings of safety in your own home. These are all things we can work with. The next one is a lack of beauty, and this can be inside, outside. So if you, for instance, have hated your bedroom ever since you moved into your apartment or house, and you hate it because the walls are a mustard yellow that someone else chose 15 years ago, I'm begging you to paint the walls. Now, this is one of those things that is not free to do. This is a time investment. It's a financial investment. But paint is not the most expensive thing you can buy. You don't need all that much of it usually for something like a bedroom. And it can literally change your stress levels. It has been shown that greens, blues, and pinks increase the level of parasympathetic nervous action in your body. So that means that they will calm you that help help maintain your stress levels just by the color that you choose in your room. Bright, sort of neony, bright red and, and bright, like just bright, strong colors in your room, not necessarily re relaxing. However, caveat here, if you find those colors relaxing and you think they're relaxing, then they probably are. 
So you have to balance this between some whatever science is telling us at the moment and whatever you actually feel in your space. The question is whether or not you find the space that you sleep in relaxing. And not just the place that you sleep in, but I think that that's a really good place to start. If, for instance, I had a client a couple of years ago who had photos, pictures, or paintings, I can't remember which, that had been waiting to be hung up in her bedroom for like three years. And one of her homework assignments was to hang up the pictures in her bedroom. And she put them up and she said, I can't believe what a difference it makes to have them on the wall. I really love them. I love looking at them. They make me feel good. Making yourself feel good in your own space is really important. So do use whatever hacks you need to use. If you have the money and you can afford changing a whole bunch of stuff that is bothering you, go for it. If you are in a more financially insecure position and you can't make a ton of changes, then maybe change out the throw pillows on your couch or the blanket or the throw blanket on your couch, or maybe buy a better pillow for your neck. If you're going to bed every single night and you're thinking, I hate my pillow, I'm not going to get a good night's sleep. I'm not going to feel rested and my neck is going to hurt in the morning. Guess what? You're activating your stress response system. So making these small changes can make a huge overall shift for you long-term. So we have lack of access to green space, lack of exposure to dusk, dawn, natural light, feelings of a physical lack of safety in your home, having a lack of beauty in your home. And we have two more things. One is a lack of community. And community is part of your environment because you should feel community within your household if there's other people that live with you and or around your household. So if there is no community at all in your neighborhood, if even if the only community you have is that you have a dog and the fellow dog walkers say hello to each other when they're out, that matters. So I want you to sit and consider what kind of community you can have within your space. Maybe you start going to your local library once a month for a reading or something. There's, there's something probably going on somewhere that you can join and be a part of. You don't have to have 18 best friends there, but if you have people around your area that are helpful, that helps you long-term maintain your stress levels, feel like you have access to resources, increase your vagal tone. This is helpful for so many things. And then the last thing that we'll talk about today, the sixth factor, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, that's six. These are not the only factors. There's always more. I'd love to hear which ones came up for you when we were talking about this idea of environment. The last one is quality of lighting. This means if you have like a lot of fluorescent lighting in your workspace, you might be more vulnerable to burnout. This is the spectrum of lighting that you use in your home. This is um, whether or not you have lamps instead of only overhead ceiling lighting. Lamps are shown to um, be more gentle and be like sort of less invasive for your body. So the quality of, and this also is about, and you might not, this is, might not be something that you're able to change, but this also is about your access to natural light through what kind of windows you have, wh which way your house is facing, how many trees are around your house, or if you're in a city, what buildings are nearby you, if, if you get sunlight in your windows at all. Um, and so the quality of lighting that you have can be really important. And so here, I don't wanna get into specifics about which light bulbs are best or what spectrums are best or what colors, or none of that. What I want you to consider is, are there any lights or lamps in your household that jar you? When you turn them on, do you feel jarred? And if there are lights or lamps in your household that jar you, see if there's an adjustment that you can make in a light bulb kind of scenario that's fairly cheap and fairly easy to change, that won't be too, too difficult. I had somebody who had those like recessed lights in their ceiling that were so bright that she couldn't like handle them at all. Now, what she wanted was to get a dimmer, but having somebody come in and put them on a dimmer seemed to be a little bit too expensive. So what she ended up doing was buying plastic, stick on cheap 
Amazon, like $2.99, and I mean $2.99, not $299, like film for the lights so that when they turned on, they were less bright. Of course, now she still can't control exactly how much light they're giving off, but she put a filter over them that was like a light gray tone that just calmed down this like feeling like she was in the spotlight every time she turned on her lights. So this, if you have an issue in your home that you'd like to adjust and you're not sure what to do to make it better, whether it's uh, paint color or lights or lamps or throw pillows or what, what kind of mug you're using in the morning, if your pan is sticking to your eggs or sticking to your pan, whatever it is, these are the kind of things that we can discuss in the Facebook group. You can come in there anytime and ask us what kind of solutions the group might be able to think of for solving something if if you have to do it on a budget and you're not sure how. There's also a group on Facebook called Handy Women, and they have all sorts of ideas on how to get things done um, in a way that's accessible and doable no matter who you are. And I think that that is fabulous. So Fried Fam, if the self-care and thinking about overall culture and hearing the news and dealing with your work environment all seems like out of your control and a little bit too much, I would love for you to choose one small shift within your environment that you could make within the next week that we talked about today or maybe something adjacent to what we talked about today that can help adjust how much fuel you have in the tank to deal with stress when it pops up. The less things you have increasing your stress levels, the easier it will, will be for you to manage life at large. Sometimes I have people do only environmental things for the first month of working with them because that's what buys us some of the energy that we need to handle the bigger things. So if things have felt too big and too much, go for the smallest change that you can make that we talked about this week and then let us know how it goes for you. All right, Fred fam. Talk soon. <laughs>